everybody. If we could uh, find our seats, please. The clock in the back of the sanctuary is wrong. Do not worry. We are starting relatively on time. I'd ask that you'd please stand for our time of prayer, and then we'll go right into our call to worship. All right, please pray with me. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for gathering us here this morning. Lord, you have been good. You are good. I pray that as we sing these songs as your congregation and as we hear the words of your word that you have left to us for our encouragement and strength, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see how much you were with us this past week and even today. And I pray, Lord, that this would strengthen us to continue for this next day. You give us one day at a time, and sometimes it feels important to just focus on one hour at a time. But I do pray, Lord, that, we, that your congregation here would be strengthened in knowing that you are with us through it all, that you guide us, and... Lord, that you have taken it upon yourself and covenant to finish what you have started. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that as we realize this more and more, that your name would be glorified from our hearts that have been purified by you, and that more and more good works would come from us, really coming from you, as we will lay all of our crowns at your feet. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let us pray, uh, sing together, Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
Amen. Let us behold Christ from Ezekiel three sixteen through 21. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, I will require to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have, a, you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered." But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. Let us pray. Lord Christ, we thank you for giving us this instruction here, which carries forward into our Acts passage this morning. We thank you for showing us what you require of us, where our boundaries are, where they begin and where they stop. You tell us here, Lord, that we have a responsibility to let people know your will, but it is not our responsibility to force it into their will. Lord, I am reminded of an old saying that you can lead a horse to the water but cannot make them drink, but woe to the one that does not lead the horse. Lord Christ, there are ways in which we have neglected our responsibilities to each other this past week. Lord, whether it was in a case like this where we were to warn people of righteousness and unrighteousness, or if we have neglected our responsibilities to you in other ways, such as in our vocation to our families or our responsibility to our church family, or even our responsibility to our, as a citizen of this county and state and nation. And so, Lord, we must come before you seeking repentance, which you alone grant. And so we ask that you would work through giving gifts to our elder, who is himself a gift, as all elders are. We ask, Lord, that you'd work through him, leading us into confession and a pardon and an assurance of pardon in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, we are we are considering our discontentment in our callings and in our vocations, as Pastor Jesse just alluded to. Too often, too often we wrestle with our service to the Lord. We often cannot trust that our stewardship in our calling and in our work is to be for the glory of Christ, whereas too often it's to the glory of this world or to ourselves. If we were to just pause and take notice to how God provides in general and special ways, we might better appreciate our service to our King, Lord Christ. Just yesterday, I was struck by this example. We were vacationing this past week at Deep Creek Lake. When we were departing, one of us while trying to pull out of a very difficult driveway, was struck by another car. It was a fairly horrific event at the time. Everyone was thankfully, and by God's grace, okay. In preparation for this, for this very subject of resting, of resting in our callings, 
I could not help but to see the incident through an unusual, unusual lens. The design of the cars had to have the safety and well-being of its passengers as its high, highest priority within their design. They were designed to easily compress with a front impact and be strengthened if there was a side impact. Airbags and seat belts were there to aid with the momentum of the sustaining forces which were violent at the time. If careful attention was not given to the work and labor of their design, the outcome would surely be different. If more attention by the landlord was given to the blind spots that were present, injury could have been avoided. All of this to say our vocations have purpose. When we neglect and grumble with the labor of our hands, in whatever capacity we find ourselves in, we're not seeking the Lord in how it is that we manage our stewardship. The stewardship of our hands, the stewardship of our hearts, and how it is that we manage this day-to-day -day activity which we find ourselves in. As Christians, we are to be content. Content in whatever and wherever the Lord has us. Taking every opportunity to wisely make decisions, and being content in our vocations. This should be our way of resting in our work and minding our business. 1 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12, But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you would walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack in nothing. Severn Run, bow with me, your heads, and pray in confession in accordance with these thoughts. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we approach you in confession of discontentment in our callings, even neglecting them altogether. We wrestle too often when we are influenced by the world. This world serves only self. This lie has laid a foundation and foothold at times in our hearts and minds. The voices from the world cry out and tell us that we need more, we need less, we need change, we need status, we just need to live. We need to serve the prince of this earth if we want peace. We know that these are lies. And they flow from the father of lies. Why do we grumble when tasks are before us? Driven by the lusts of our flesh, saying deeper, deeper, does this pit need to be dug? Just a little deeper. More of anything is often our desire. Oh, to just rest in your promises. To rest in our callings and work for your glory. Brothers and sisters, in the silence of your hearts, cry out to your heavenly Father now and confess your discontentment in where the Lord has you as well as where, he know, where you know he wants you.
Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. Amen. Here, brothers and sisters, these words of assurance and pardon taken from Isaiah 12, 1 through 3. And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Praise be to God. Brothers and sisters, there is a day for those of us who will see his face. There will be him, our king, as a perfect steward, in perfect vocation, in that holy place for all eternity, let us stand. Let us stand and sing, there is a Redeemer in response to this good news. Brothers and sisters, let us continue to worship him as our usher brings forth our tithes and offerings.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these tithes and offerings are, yes, the first fruits of our labor. They are given to you out of the hearts of stewards for your kingdom. Where there is grumbling, give the contentment. Where there is generosity, improve on their hearts. Lord, bless these and multiply them for the advancement of your kingdom here on earth till you come. Amen. Thank you. You may continue to stand for the reading of God's word, and children three and under are uh, able to go to nursery. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 18. And I'll read through verse 17. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. For now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Hustus, one who worshipped God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Acacia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio took no notice of these things. Let us pray. Lord, you instruct us in your instruction from Paul to Timothy that your word is profitable. That is our expectation here this morning. And so we pray that you yourself would teach us by your spirit and the preached word. We ask, Lord, that in the hearing of your word, we would be the doers of your word also. And may you receive all of the glory from our good works, which you bring about through the work of your spirit. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated. Well, last week, 
Considering Paul's Athens sermon, we acknowledge that God has ordained Jesus as the Christ who will judge the world in righteousness. That is good news. Consequently, on our part, and really this should be the message to the whole world, it is an act of wisdom to repent and kiss the Son as instructed in Psalm 2. I was recently reading a book by a gentleman named William Perkins. I have his volumes in my office. And when he gets to a section in his book, one of his books in volume 8, he asks the question, what is the most wise thing for a person to do? Because he's getting into the virtue of prudence. Listen to what he says. It's the same thing we, had, we learned last week. A person must, in the first place, and above all things in the world, carefully provide for the forgiveness of their sins and the salvation of their soul. And sinners and unrepentant persons are in Scripture termed fools because they fail in this single point of wisdom, going on in their sin without repentance. It's the same wisdom we learned about last week. And now this week, we continue with wisdom still, but it is a different kind of wisdom, and it is taught to us in the city of Corinth. And so now I'd like to just make a few observations with you that you can be sure to understand our reading this morning a bit better. Here is observation number one. Paul continues his custom of preaching in the synagogue, verse 4, but we are going to learn more about how Paul thinks of his vocation or calling as a preacher and an apostle and evangelist. There's more information given here this morning than you've had through the book of Acts. The information on how Paul conceives of himself is uh, gained by understanding that that little quote that he gave there about blood being on their own head, which we read already this morning in the bulletin, is Paul's knowledge of himself as a watchman from Ezekiel chapter 33. He's actually framing his work as an apostle in terms of a watchman. Very important. Watchmen are commissioned to look for danger and to blow a trumpet in order to alert a town. If the watchman does not blow the trumpet, then God holds him responsible for the death of the people. Their blood will be on his hand, so to speak. If, however, he blows the trumpet and they don't listen, clearly hearing the trumpet, then those people are responsible for for their own demise. I think you get the idea, although in our culture we don't have castles and trumpets and watchmen like that, but you get the idea. Paul has been explaining. Paul has been demonstrating. Paul has been instructing. And therefore, this is a kind of trumpet. In fact, in the Reformation era, preaching was often termed a kind of trumpet to the nations, alerting them to repent and to believe. And what he's saying to them is they're refusing to hear, and therefore blood will be upon their own hands. Since the Jews refuse to listen, their blood is upon their own head, and from now on, Paul will focus on the Gentiles. You can see that on verse 6. That's the first observation, is just to understand a little bit more about what it means for Paul to be in his role, in his commission. Now... By this time, you can see, in going from city to city and being confronted over and over again, verse 9 should not be too too surprising for us, which is our second observation. And that is that Jesus Christ, because of something that's going on with Paul and something that happens with all of Christians, Jesus encourages Paul. He encourages Paul to continue in his vocation. He spoke with Paul in the night by a vision And he reasserts a promise that the Son has been asserting to his church for a very long time. You can see in our passage that it says, I am with you. We know that the Son had said the same thing in Deuteronomy chapter 31 to his people. The eternal Son said the same thing in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5. Sorry, Matthew 28, 20. The Son incarnate says the same thing, for I am with you. And I want to quote here another one from Hebrews chapter 13 to show you that this promise comes along in every vocation to which Christ calls you, that he will be with you. 
It's not just isolated to war times. It's not just isolated to apostles or special commissions like that. When we turn to Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, it is a declaration and promise that goes out to the whole congregation, and it says this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What a lovely promise that he has given to Paul in the night. Specifically for Paul, Christ reassures him that he has many people in that city whose names are in the book of life, and so in Christ's protection of him, he will be able to stay longer. You can see the length of his stay there in our passage. This uh, way in which Christ continues to encourage him is not just in words in the night, but also how it unfolds in manifest reality. Did you notice some of the events that would have been important for Paul to see that Christ is taking care of him? Same kind of thing that happens within our life. Notice first that the promise starts to come through and that Paul's preaching results in a strategic su success in terms of the location of the preaching. In verse 7, Hustus or Justice offers his house for the church to meet. So you have this accumulating group of people who are believing Paul's understanding of the Old Testament that Jesus from Nazareth is the Christ and they start to gather in Justice's or Hustus's home and guess where that is located? Next door to the synagogue. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Next door to the synagogue. You know, I, I saw a, a similar occurrence to this in that the uh, pregnancy clinics that we, the pregnancy clinic that we support went ahead and uh, camped out across the street from uh, Planned Parenthood. You can imagine the, the same kind of situation, calling the, the ladies to, no, come on over here. And they actually stand on that corner and they can point to the house and say, you don't want to go there. You want to go here. This is healthier. This is health. And you, got, you have the same kind of picture here with Paul. In other words, he has prime real estate. You could even imagine, uh, for example, if the, class, the houses were close enough, people seeking to go into the old synagogue and Paul saying, no, uh, over here, over here. That's one way in which Christ is comforting and showing in manifest reality that he is present and that he is taking care of them. Second, I want you to notice that the Jews bring charges against Paul. They now are going to um, take him to the judgment seat in verse 12. But you see what the ascended Christ does, does who is the ultimate judge and works through all judges. Christ thwarts their plans by controlling the judgment of Gallio in verse 14. And actually, those who brought him, or the one who represented those bringing Paul on false charges, they were the ones who received the trouble. You can see in verse 17 that they are beat. They are beaten. Now, if you were to take those two observations, you can see a very clear doctrine that it's forming here for all of Christians here. And it is this, though Christ will judge the world in righteousness fully in the future, that's reference to last week's sermon, though Christ will judge the world in righteousness fully in the future, he begins even now by advancing and supporting your calling. He begins even now by advancing and supporting his kingdom through your callings, Christian, you can put this very, in a very short way, and you could just say, Christian, the ascended Christ is with you in your calling. And I just can't think of a greater strengthening comfort that we could receive this morning as those who have been called by Christ. That is our teaching. What a comfort not only to Paul, but a strength to us. Well, I, I want to use this as an opportunity to talk about our callings, therefore. We've been focused on our participation with Christ in various areas over the last few weeks. If you remember the call to you that you are to be serpents and doves, that you are to exercise the prudence of repentance, 
All of these things have been calls to action. And this week, we have the opportunity to be strengthened in those calls to action, to remain in harmony with the important acknowledgement that it is only because Christ is with us that we have any success for his kingdom in our callings. That is why you are fruitful or productive in anything. And I do hope that by the end of the sermon, somehow you would be thankful for what Christ has been doing in you. I think if you were to be honest and look back on your life, you'll see that Christ has done an awful lot. And you should have um, not just the idea of, of labor in your mind that you're to keep working harder, but move into a time of joy of the life that God has given to you. It's one of the goals of the sermon. Now to get there, and the, what I'd like to do is really spend most of the time showing you a misunderstanding that has taken place even in my own life early on in my conversion to Christianity, and then I want to look at the correction to that misunderstanding, and that'll be our application this morning. And so in our calling, we must avoid misunderstandings. Now, when I first became a Christian, the evangelical world taught that God's will uh, or purpose for life was hidden. You don't know what his will is for you. So when anybody talked to me about my calling, it was something I didn't know what it was, and I had to figure out some kind of strategy in order to discover what he had hidden for me. And when I did, it would be obvious and kind of glamorous, like a rock star in some sense. You could think of a missionary even as a kind of a glamorous um, a calling in, in that evangelical world. Once you did, in fact, find the calling through various signs and, and perhaps even night visions within that world, he would reveal each day other secrets so that you would know what you're supposed to do that day. But really, interacting with God was all just a big secret, and I had to wait for him to reveal himself and what he wanted, and then I would know what to do. I remember being discipled very early on, asking the question, does God want me to eat, to drink Coke or Pepsi? And asking the church community, how am I supposed to know which one he doesn't or does want me to drink? And I ended up not drinking either because he never revealed it to me. And now I know he just wants me to have water because I gain weight too quickly. I don't know if you have a similar experience in growing up in the evangelical world, but under, the understanding of your calling and your vocation and God's will can come across like that, and I still think it is present, so it's worth me speaking about this morning. The problem, though, is that that is a misunderstanding, and you're, it's a total misconception of how God actually communicates his will. Let me just tell you that God does, in fact, have a hidden will, and it will remain hidden to you. That's why it's hidden. God teaches his will for us, or our calling in the scriptures, and that he does not have one good thing for us that we are to do or that we have to discover. Let me say that again, because it's very important and it contradicts a major movement in the broad evangelical world. Many folks still come to me in counsel, and the way they pose the question tells me they've been influenced by a misunderstanding in the evangelical world. So let me just restate that. God teaches his will for us or our calling in the scriptures. If you want to know what his calling is for you, it's already in the scriptures. And here's another thing that is usually a surprise to people when we start to work this out specifically. God does not have one good thing for you to do that you must discover. Today, he probably has a hundred good things for you to do, and in wisdom, you have to do one, or you should do one. He has a lot of good things for us to do in our ordinary callings, and the way to determine which things we should do, the opportunities that we should take that he has given to us, is that we must choose some in wisdom. Now, let me just put this starkly and partially I don't know, it's like a heretical illustration, just bear with me. In other words, I want you to pretend with me that we lost our minds and decided, even the adults, to have a lock-in sleepover at the church because somebody told us it would be fun. It was a lie. It's not going to be fun. I like my bed. 
Even if I brought an air mattress, it would be uncomfortable. But, you know, this ends up being a bit different because while we're locked in this church overnight, Jesus appears to us in a vision. And I know, and if that in fact did happen, I know exactly what he would say at that lock-in. Are you ready? He would say, you were called as a Christian in the areas of your family. I want you to serve each other as church members, and I want you to be good citizens in civic society. Every day I have arranged your life so that you have many good things to do. I want you to use the wisdom that I've given to you, and I want you to decide how you want to serve me bringing heaven to earth. Goodbye for now. And that could have been received by just reading the scriptures. I know that Jesus would say that, in fact, because he already did. We don't need a new night vision. His general will for us, the basic and ordinary boundaries in which we should work, have been communicated through the prophets and the apostles, and has been the same for all human beings from the beginning. Now... Through wisdom, we must decide how to serve from day to day in those ordinary callings. And therein lies the whole journey of the Christian life. It is you moving from one horizon to the next, and the change is wisdom. You grow more and more into the wise image of Jesus Christ, knowing what God's will is in general from the Scriptures, and how to do that specifically with the Uh, cards that he has handed you for the day. Now, let's tie that back into the main teaching. Christ is with us in our callings. The problem, as I stated, the misunderstanding is that the broad evangelical church teaches that Christ is with you when you discover his hidden calling. And I'll tell you the truth. I was on that railroad track and it was nothing but discouraging. What about God's calling for my actual life and not the one that I have to wait for some hidden revealed will for? What about all the other seconds of the day except for the glamorous and the extraordinary that rarely happens in my life? And so this morning we are setting the record straight and it's a short and simple message really. We're almost through this sermon. He promises his presence and power as you you serve him in the ordinary, as a family, as a church family, and as a citizen. And the more and more we can begin to embrace that as a group of people, the greater chance we have of moving from just understanding our calling to taking joy in them. You will actually discover that God will give you more rest than you will give yourself and make you more fruitful than you could ever imagine still. There's a series of questions that I think arise out of this basic message that you've heard this morning. The first one is kind of obvious. How is Christ with you in your callings right now? I got the opportunity to think back a little bit. Some of you warned me that the little years passed quickly, and last night Ellie celebrated homecoming, so there it went. Little years gone for one of them. And some of you also experienced that. And I was just thinking back, looking back as the time has passed. Some regrets because of who I am, but mostly just seeing what Christ has done despite me. And I hope that you can have that experience too. How is Christ with you in your callings right now? How is he moving in ways that are small? What are the good things which Christ has given to you already and that he supports? Is there a way for you to start taking joy in the fact that he's given you some garlic bulbs to plant that they might be ready in the spring? I'm talking about things that simple. That's what he's called you to. What about as a mom or as a dad? What has Christ called you to and how is he present with you in those things that you have to do today? You know how many things you have to do today, mom? And you, dad, and you, grandmother, and you, grandfather, and you, church member, you know how many needs are already out there for you to choose from? So many good things that you know are his will. What about brothers and sisters and families and in church families? 
Can you see, as I begin to ask all of those questions, that you have no time for God's hidden will? Can you see that in these everyday relationships, you have so much to do? And the message this morning is that Christ is with you in every aspect of it. Our main doctrine this morning is that though Christ will judge the world in righteousness fully in the future, he begins even now by advancing and supporting the callings of his people. In other words, Christian, the ascended Christ is with you in your calling. Now that is meant to be a strengthening message. And it's strengthening in part, as I've brought up this morning, because your calling is not hidden. Though your calling will change over time, and we could talk about the different seasons of our life, which would be important. We relate to family, we relate to church, we relate to society, and we are meant to do so for the honor of Christ in good ways. That's it. I wonder if you have been waiting for something else. I would like to pluck that out of your soul so that you can begin living now. Something secret and hidden and glamorous, perhaps, is what you've been waiting for. I'm here to tell you, you're not going to be a rock star. That's not Christ's will for you. That is a fiction. And the only thing that it really accomplishes is regret because you're missing out on the life that he actually has for you. You will regret not enjoying your ordinary callings and the season of those callings. Yes, the world is full of trouble, but I want you to be honest with yourself. Think of yourself relative to other countries. Has not God given us relatively quiet lives? where we can order them and do the things that we would like to do for him? All the different choices that we have for schooling and activities we want to do with each other and the people that we love, there's been some restrictions on those things, but nothing like what we see in other places. God has given us an answer to the prayer of Christians for many generations that we'd be able to just mind our own business grow our gardens, and live ordered lives wherein he is present, doing good works through us. That he would gather more people in, and therefore more work would be done, and more joy taken, even consummating in worship. Even if it is difficult, and there are difficult parts of life, I just wonder, are you slowing down enough? Are you living in the moment enough? to enjoy working with the Lord today in what he has handed to you. This is the kind of message that we see present within our scriptures today. It's underneath everything that Paul does. If you were to read his other passages and explaining how he felt about times like this, is that he was content. And he took one step at a time. He didn't know what was going to happen when he was drugged to the judgment seat, but boy, was he glad with the way that it happened. He didn't know there was going to be a teaching center next door to the main synagogue. He just took one day at a time, trusting in the promises of God. And that is our call, too. It's our call, it's our call to do that in each of those domains. And it should be a call that we are joyful about and hopeful about because our main message this morning is that Christ is present in the actual lives that he has given to us a simple message. You know what the ultimate message is this morning, or really the ultimate question? If Christ is present in your actual life, I think the ultimate question you have to ask is, are you present? Are you missing out on what he has laid already on your lap that he's just waiting for you to pick up and to do? If you're having trouble determining what that is, just come and see me. I, I see all the things that you should be doing. <laughs> and we'll ask your wife or your husband or your friends. And I'll tell you, there's just so much that the Lord has given to us to do good and to take joy in. Simple things. 
and he will be present with us in it all. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this morning's message that you've given to us. It's nice that it is plain, it is simple. It's what we need to be strengthened. We just need some meat and potatoes. And we thank you for that this morning. I pray, Lord, that we would not just be hearers of a message like this, but that we would be doers. And so, Lord, I ask for two things for your congregation this morning. I ask first that you would give them fortitude once they see all of the things that you have for them to do, they have to do it. And that will require sometimes courage and stamina to actually do it, because sometimes these things are long-term goals. And I also pray, Lord, for temperance. Or, and that is to say, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the will to stick with you and to avoid temptation. Lord, the father of lies has placed a million things out there, all of which seem good, but end up being distractions from the main vocations that you've given to us. And so, Lord, we end up neglecting our families and our church families and even our, the civic realm because of the way they have structured even society itself. And so pray, I pray, Lord, that you would deliver your people from temptation that you would give them a sense of what is a truly ordered life. Where do things belong? What deserves my time? What priority do these different things get? And I pray that you would help them to make those kind of decisions in the heat of advertisement and neighbors pleading and children wanting to go off in that direction. And uh, Lord, there are consequences to all of that. So I pray that that you would mold and you would shape us, that we would be a wise community in these ways. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. Let us stand for our invitational song to the supper. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. And I ask the elders to please prepare the table.
Amen. You may be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ continues to strengthen us, even in this moment, showing His presence with us by this table and His communion with us by His Spirit. He gives us this bread and this wine and grape juice this morning to strengthen us in the knowledge of Him and what He requires of us, that is to say, His will for us. He gives us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 27, a warning about the table. He is a Lord who has good boundaries. And so he lays a boundary down as to who is able to partake of this supper with him. And he says that we must take this quite seriously, at least that's what's underlying these statements. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many die. And so I encourage you to examine yourself. If you know that you have not made a profession of faith, you don't believe that Christ will return and judge the world in righteousness, for example, that Christ will not judge the world in righteousness, if you are not a Christian, then this table is not for you. Or if you've been raised as a covenant child, but you still don't understand who Christ is in a way where you could explain that, for example, to the elders then I ask that you would not come to the table yet, but that you would keep working on your instruction and your catechism. Keep pulling on your parents' sleeve, saying that you would like to get to the Lord's Supper. For those of you who are Christians, this has been set aside for you, like I mentioned, that you would be strengthened. This imagery that we have goes back quite some time, even to the Passover, when the Lord was with his people then and delivered them out of Egypt. And we know that our lives are like that also, that we have been delivered from a great Pharaoh, one who held us in slavery to sin and to ignorance. But Christ has taken us through those waters, even the waters of baptism. And he has brought us into a time where we are awaiting for the new heavens and the new earth. We're in a kind of wilderness. One of the comments that many people make as we consider the bread and the wine in relationship to the Passover and into the Christian life is that as soon as he brought them into the wilderness, he gave them the commands that they might know how to be his people, how to love him and how to love each other. And I'll just make the observation this morning for your strength that the fourth commandment is one of rest. It is what we are doing here. And after we are given rest, we then move into that time in the commandments where we see how we are to serve our neighbor. And I'd like you to draw this connection, which I've told you before. I'm here just reminding you of this. That Christ gives you rest so that you can love each other again so that you can be neighborly. He gives you the time, and he gives you the space, and he gives you the vocation that you might serve him. The temptation which I pray that you will resist and that you will use this table to resist temptation is to return back to Pharaoh and to work for this world and for sin instead of Christ. I pray that you would see that your only hope lies in Christ and what he has done for you, what he is doing for you, and what he will do for you in his return. Please pray with me. Father, we know that you have given us your Son, your only begotten Son, and we thank you. It is right to give you thanks. Lord Jesus Christ, we know that you are the one, by way of your Spirit, that administers this supper effectually. And we have talked a little bit, Lord, of what you've 
told us that the bread and the wine mean what you mean and what you require of us, therefore. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would strengthen your congregation, that they would set these elements from their common use, and they would instead, by faith, see what you are accomplishing and who you are, and that you are present with us even now as we seek to serve you in our callings. I thank you that you have given us an example of serving the Father in your calling. And I thank you for showing us that he was with you every moment, though you experienced much difficulty, and that even in the crucifixion, his presence was there. And though it looked like he had departed, Lord, we know from Peter's sermons that it was all a part of his plan. We thank you, Lord, and we ask that you would comfort us as we deal with difficult providences here this morning. Pray that you would especially comfort those who are tempted to think you're no longer there, that you would firm up their faith. I pray that you would do so not only through this table, that you would do so through a kind and timely word today. In the name of Christ, amen. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll take the bread, and we'll eat together as a family when the time comes. Thank you, brothers. Let us now, in remembrance of our Christ and all that he has instructed us in this morning, let us take and eat.
Lord, as we see the broken bread by faith and remember that you were broken for us, not only that our sins would be forgiven, but that we would be accredited your righteousness and given your spirit, wherein we begin to do good works for you, we realize that our callings and the work we do has come at a great price. I ask, Lord Jesus Christ, that our remembrance of you in this way would motivate us out of thankfulness to serve you, that we would remember what it has taken to get us to be people that are productive for you. I ask these things in your name. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Can you stand, brothers? And of course, all that we have received from the Lord today may be summarized in Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let us take and drink. Lord, we thank you for the reminder here that you are with us in disciple-making and you are with us as we seek to be your disciples. And we thank you, Lord, for your instruction this morning that you have shown us that you don't support us in conceit or the seeking of fame or glamour, but in the contentment and joy that you give us in our ordinary domains, vocations, and callings. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that we would have a greater knowledge of your presence with us, that we, Lord, would always have that as a part of our faith, and that it would grow evermore, that we, Lord, from that would serve you with greater and greater life, and that we would be a kind of beacon of joy to those around us, that people would look at us and see that we are a people of purpose, that we are a people that know what our business is, and that we do it in great hope because we know that because you are our Savior and the things that you have promised our labor is not in vain. We thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. Let us stand and close our service in song.
amen. And now receive the Lord's benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, may he strengthen your hearts and establish you in every good word and in every good work.